I failed the Condé Nast typing test twice. It was 1992 and I was a recent college graduate and I desperately wanted to be in magazine journalism and in order to work at any Condé Nast magazine in New York, you had to pass this ridiculous typing test. So I finally passed it on the third try, but I still didn't get a job. I was just this girl from a small town in Connecticut and I didn't really look the part, I wasn't very sophisticated, and I think ultimately it just wasn't a good fit. So I decided that I was going to engage in the time-honored tradition of slinging drinks at a bar and trying to write the great American novel. One day, a friend of mine who was interning at Rolling Stone called me up, and he said to me, Hunter S. Thompson is looking for an editorial assistant for his new novel. Do you want to put your hat into the ring? So it was that Hunter S. Thompson, Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas, Hunter S. Thompson. And I wasn't a sycophant, but I'd read his books. I knew about the drugs and the guns and the women. So I said, sure. <laughs> I wanted to be a writer. And I thought this was one way to do it. So I wrote a letter, and in the letter, in addition to mentioning other inappropriate things, I made sure to say at the very end that I was a full-time bartender, thinking that this would get me some cred. I faxed it to him, because that's what you did in 1992, <laughs> and I went to work. I come home, stumbling home at 2.30 in the morning, tipsy myself, get into bed, 3 a.m., the phone rings and I hear this mumbly baritone on the other end of the line. And he says, Cheryl there? I said, speaking. He goes, this is Hunter S. Thompson. I read your letter and I liked it. Can you get out here tomorrow? <laughs> so without any thought of how I was going to do it, I just said, yes. He says, great, my assistant will call you in the morning with all the details, but I'm gonna meet you at Aspen Airport. I'll be the one with the red umbrella. <laughs> so the next morning, I'm woken up rather early, and it's his personal assistant, and she gives me the details. She says, there's a ticket waiting for you at LaGuardia. Go now. You'll come out here for a three-day trial period. And if you do well, you'll go back and get your things and come back out. And if you don't, you'll go home for good. And she made sure to tell me the return ticket was already bought. So I pack a duffel bag and I barely tell anybody that I'm going out there because in case I failed at that too, I just wanted to slip back into my life, however pathetic it was. So I land in Aspen and I walk out of the gate and sure enough, as promised, there's Hunter S. Thompson with a giant red umbrella in the middle of the airport, looking like he's working for traveler's insurance. So he looks like this deranged Mary Poppins. He's got on the glasses and the hat, and he's got the converse on. And I go up and introduce myself, and he's very shy. And he just walks me out to the parking lot. And there is the red shark. So for those of you who know Hunter's work, the red shark is a 1970 Chevy Impala convertible that has played more than a passing role in much of his work. I can't believe I'm about to get into the shark. It's this thing, it's like getting inside of a whale. It's like a sofa on wheels. And I get in there and forget about texting and driving. He has a full-on tumbler of scotch and he just starts going well above the speed limit. <laughs> we go to the Woody Creek Tavern for lunch. And then we walk in and the whole place starts buzzing. And he doesn't ask me what I want. He just orders enough food for about six or seven people. He orders tamales and hamburgers and french fries. And all this food comes. And when it comes, he just starts pouring condiments all over it, mostly hot sauce. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm waiting for something kind of interview-like to happen. But instead, he just starts talking about the election. He starts talking about his neighbor, something about cattle. Then he brings up guns, and I say, oh, I've never shot a gun, and his eyebrows go up. And then I try to bring it around to an interview, and I say, so what are you working on right now? And he says, it's a novel. And I say, well, what would my job be as your assistant? And he just orders another round. <laughs> so he orders us two biffs, which is a whiskey and Bailey's shooter, and we 
down those, and he asks for a piece of chocolate cake to go. <laughs> we end up back in the shark, and he takes a plastic bag from his pocket, and he starts shoving what's ever in this plastic bag into the chocolate cake. <laughs> then he turns to me, hands me the cake and a plastic fork. So I think this is a test. <laughs> and I look down into the cake and I realize that what he has shoved into the cake is hallucinogenic mushrooms. <laughs> so I figure if I want this job, when Hunter S. Thompson hands you a fork, you just take a bite. <laughs> so I take a giant bite of the cake and I hand it back to him and he takes a giant bite of the cake. And then he starts the shark up. Then he procures a bottle of Chivas from underneath the front seat, <laughs> takes a big swig off of it and hands it to me. And at this point, I'm like, well, OK. <laughs> so I take a swig, and we start winding our way up the mountain. When we get to the top, there is a group of tourists hanging out. And Hunter takes from the back of the seat a screecher gun. So this doesn't hold ammo. It's used to scare away birds from crops. But these people don't know that. They see Hunter S. Thompson plus gun equals something crazy is about to happen. And then we rear up in the car, and he grabs my hand, and he shoots the gun. It makes this god-awful noise. And he says, yee-haw. And I say, yee-haw, because it seems like the thing to do. We turn, do a donut in the shark, and we end up going back down the mountain. And sure enough, a minute later, a squad car materializes. <laughs> So he takes my face in his hands and he says, listen to me. You don't ever have to talk to the cops. Do you understand me? <laughs> and I know he's being serious, but at this point I am shrooming out of my mind and all I can do is crack up. So I start laughing, thinking we can't be in any kind of real trouble. So the cops come over and they ask me my name and I can't say anything. They ask him what my name is, and he doesn't say anything. And finally, he just says, we're not talking to you. <laughs> so the cops go behind the car, and they start deliberating. And I can only imagine what this conversation is like. Like, do we mess with the local color? Do we make the big score? They check out the gun. They see that it's fake. And they decide to let the shrooming drunk man go. So we end up back down at his house. The only way I can describe the house is honky-tonk meets architectural digest. <laughs> and that's where I meet his personal assistant, who's this kind of graying, long-haired, beautiful hippie. And she sees me, and she takes me aside. And no doubt she has seen this before, the first day mushrooms. And <laughs> she says to me, try to keep up, but you know, don't try to keep up. And she says, you're going to be staying with me over at the cabin next door. Come over when you're ready. So now I think our interview is about to start. I'm here for a job. But instead what happens is Hunter goes to the fridge and he takes out a pitcher of margaritas, a bottle of green chartreuse, a tray of cocaine, he gets a whole key lime pie, and a 22 rifle, and he takes everything and I follow him back to the hot tub room where he puts everything down and puts Caligula in the VCR. So I feel a little bit uncomfortable, but I soon realize <laughs> for him, this is Tuesday. <laughs> so day one ends. My Hunter S. Thompson starter package is done, and I go back to the cabin and pass out. Day two. I go to his house, and there is none of this merry prankster anymore. He is convinced that our run-in with the cops yesterday is going to land him in prison for the rest of his life, and that I'm going to prison too. And he's been on the phone with lawyers all morning, and he's full of paranoia and rage. And he hands me a notebook, and he says, here's what the lawyers told us to do. You have to write down everything we did yesterday. I start writing and writing and writing, and I think to myself, well, this is kind of like a job. <laughs> <laughs> I 
this is kind of like a job you would do for Hunter S. Thompson. So I'm writing and writing and writing, and then he says, now you can't leave. And I think, maybe I just got a promotion. <laughs> so later on in our conversation, he mentions one of his books, one that I hadn't read. And when I, he finds out that I didn't read it, he gets really upset. And he goes and he gets it from the back room and he slams it in front of me and he says, go back to the cabin and read this and don't come back till you've done it. And I was like, oh. So I go back and I have my tail between my legs and his assistant is there and she says, oh, don't worry about that. He'll apologize tomorrow. And I go back and I sit in my bed and I start reading the book and I start doing the math. I say, do I even want this job? And I think, yes, this is better. It's better than imposter syndrome and going home to slinging Malibu and Diet Cokes to people. And sure enough, in the middle of the night, there's a note of apology slid under my door. Day three brings more of the same. It's more drugs, it's more guns, it's more pie, it's more wigs. <laughs> It's just more of everything, and I'm waiting to find out what this job is and if I'm even remotely close to getting it. <laughs> and just as I'm losing all hope that anything remotely resembling work is going to happen, Hunter puts a piece of paper into his typewriter, and he goes, plink, plunk. And I laugh to myself, because he would have failed the Condé Nast typing test, too. <laughs> He keeps typing away and he pulls it out and he says, fax this to CNN right now. And I look at it and it's a note to Ed Turner saying how criticizing the election coverage. So I fax that and we go out onto the shooting range because the sun is coming up at this point. And we start shooting guns. He gives me a 22 rifle. He says, this is a lady's gun. And we shoot and shoot. He says, you know what, you're a pretty good shot. And I think, well, this is as good a reason as any for me to get this job. <laughs> and I do. I'll get the job. And for five months, I was Hunter's assistant. And five months was about all I could handle. <laughs> the highs were super high, quite literally. <laughs> the lows were super low. And after the, that experience, it took me about two years to recover. <laughs> but it took many, many more years after that for me to finally figure out what that experience meant in my life. Hunter had no fear. He did have a little bit of loathing. But I would like to think that he helped this 22-year-old girl become more fearless. My last day there, the limo we had been in dropped me off at the airport and I was alone and I realized that I was sitting on his hat. I put it on, made my flight, and I'm glad I still have it. Thanks. <laughs>